Welcome to the Protecting Your Nest podcast. Many of us are fully aware of some of the reasons why many people struggle and suffer from chronic medical conditions. We now know that smoking and obesity are leading causes of preventable disease, and we've done pretty good with reducing the number of smokers. But did you know that there are only about 4,000 or so board-certified obesity medicine docs in the U.S. Now think about that. One million docs and only 4,000 educated on how to help and treat obesity. Another interesting fact is that metabolic syndrome is associated with many of those chronic illnesses, especially when you think about heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, cancer, dementia, and many, many more. Like obesity medicine, we have a shortage of clinicians who understand how to treat and manage what I believe is the number one reason why we get sick, metabolic disease. But there's hope on the horizon. One reason is because we now have the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners led by Pam Devine and Doug Reynolds. Just as exciting, we have new docs who will help lead the way since many of them will get that extra training they'll need in nutrition and metabolic health. That's why I'm so excited to welcome today's guest, Dr. Nicholas Norwitz. Dr. Nick is a researcher and scientist, and he has a PhD from Oxford and is currently working on his MD at Harvard. His research expertise is on ketosis, one of our favorite words, and brain aging, but he has also published scientific papers on topics ranging from neuroscience to heart disease, gastrointestinal health, genetics, bone health, and diabetes. He also co-authored the new Mediterranean Diet Cookbook, The Optimal Keto-Friendly Diet That Burns Fat promotes longevity, and prevents chronic disease. Dr. Nick's passion is understanding uh, the uh, root cause of disease, uh, how to heal folk, and of course, using food as medicine. And he's done that through scientific study and has discovered that healing uh, through a ketogenic diet is one of the things we should all consider if we want to reverse chronic disease. His mission is to help reform our health system and educate as many people as possible as he can. And he fully understands what it'll take to help achieve metabolic health, which is why I really wanted to have him on the Protecting Your Nest podcast. So I want to welcome you, Dr. Nick, to this episode of Protecting Your Nest. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Dr. Hampton. My pleasure. I'm so excited to have you here. And and by the way, uh, I don't know if I've told you this. I don't think I have. My oldest son, uh, Brandon, attended a summer program at Oxford. Yeah. And we actually, yeah. So, and we loved, he loved it. He loved it. He loved it. And we actually uh, were considering having him apply to Oxford. Unfortunately, my mom, <laughs> his grandmother, thought that was way too far away. And she got so concerned. <laughs> and I think things were in the world a little crazy at the time. And I said, he's probably going to be safer at Oxford than in Chicago. But she just got nervous, so we kind of, you know, let her have her way when it comes to that. So, but he did fine. He ended up at WashU in St. Louis with his brother, and uh, and as you, I think you responded to a tweet I tweeted on uh, Twitter where I showed uh, his him in his graduation outfit, and we included an image uh, of the Black Panther uh, Chadwick, and uh, it was at the underpass at WashU, mm-hmm. and your reply to that treats. Uh, said that, you know, I was just at that underpass last weekend and I saw the uh, Chatwick and was stunned. So I was curious, Dr. Nick, how in the heck, what were you doing at WashU where you were able to see that uh, beautiful uh, sign? Yeah, well, well, first of all, you couldn't choose a better university in the United States that looks pretty Oxfordy than WashU. Um, <laughs> it's really gorgeous. True. But I was, um, it is. I was there the weekend before you because my, my younger brother, is uh, going to be a junior at WashU. So we were moving him in and he was giving me a tour because it was actually my, the first time I was there. Um, I, I hadn't been able to visit before. And so, you know, we were moving stuff around. We actually got a pretty good workout. It was like two weekends ago when 99 degrees and we had to move a bunch of boxes. So it was fun. I had fun. But uh, yeah, he was he was showing me the campus and we went to the underpass and I 
first of all, I'm a giant Marvel nerd. Like I've seen everything that has ever been produced via Marvel. Um, and I won't give any Loki spoilers here, so you're all safe. But um, yeah, I mean, Ch- Chadwick Boseman's story, first of all, is just amazing. And that was just such a beautiful uh, mural. And so I was excited to see a, a picture with, with, with you and your kids there. Um, he's a pretty inspirational yeah. character. And it was, it was just a really cool painting, to be perfectly honest. It is. And uh, I'll, in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at it now. And it, on the uh, painting, it says, the struggle along the way are only meant to shape you for your purpose. And I, yeah. I thought that was a cool statement. And we all struggle, especially as we go through our educational journey. journey. But there's so many other things, particularly in St. Louis, they've had a lot of social injustice issues. And I think there's so many layers to that struggle yeah. uh, word. But but I'm just, but now I know uh, my kids and your brother need to meet, obviously. So we're going to make <laughs> sure they know each other. And so that's really cool. That, that's so cool. Uh, you got that connection there. So, so thank you for that. And I guess we'll get started. And uh, I want to kind of keep it uh, family oriented with the first uh, few thoughts. And I kind of tend to do that uh, when I, when I met Doug Reynolds and Pam Devine and they did their episode of the podcast, I asked them about how they met and all of that good stuff. And for you, I want to go backwards a little bit and think about, you know, you going back to, you know, where you grew up and, Uh, Just share a little bit about your birthplace and anything related to the early years you'd like to share with the uh, listeners. Yeah, well, to be perfectly honest, if you want to, you know, picture my childhood and upbringing, just like picture the like archetype of quite honestly, white suburban privilege. I mean, both my parents are MD PhDs. So like, you know, we we were quite stable. I lived uh, most of my life. I lived some of in Connecticut, but most of it in uh, Newton, Massachusetts. So 20 minutes outside Boston. And, you know, in a house with two parents who were together, a little brother and a little sister. I'm the oldest. Um, We had some dogs and I was privileged as different types of privilege. I was, you know, not only privileged financially, but I seem very privileged um, with respect to my health, which is the greatest type of privilege. And I didn't have any problems with health um, throughout basically all of my childhood until about age 17, 18 which is where things started to go a little bit weird for me. And we can talk about that. But in terms of my childhood, it was, um, you know, I was always a kid who loved sports. I was very active. I was actually pretty tuned in as much as you'd expect of like a sub- like just a kid into nutrition. I was interested in it. Um, and I kind of ran by the dietary guidelines, you know, uh, food pyramid and then uh, my plate. Um, I think my plate's now like 10 years old, but you know, balanced diet type thing. And I was very sporty. So did soccer. I did martial arts for like 12 years. I even in taught classes. Um, and then did like push up a thons. I actually ended up breaking two stair records and then got into distance running, um, half marathons and marathons. So, wow. um, I was, I was really into that. And quite honestly, I'll, I'll put myself on the back. I was quite good. I was a 17 year old running like sub three hour marathons. It was a lot of fun. And I just thought I was on top of the world, like I was a hot shot, did well in school, get into good schools and athletic, like I had no worries up until wow. college. <laughs> right, right. And we'll get to that because I, I heard, yeah. obviously I heard a little bit about your story and uh, I think the one of the reasons why I want you to be here is to hopefully inspire others and to know that yes, a, a young athletic person uh, who had resources can yeah. still struggle. And so that's why this knowledge is so important. And, uh, and no matter where you are in life, you can struggle. So, so I appreciate that. And, and obviously, um, I know you want to inspire others. And, uh, and I have found that, um, you know, inspiring my family can be a challenge at times. So I'm curious, how has this low carb keto lifestyle uh impacted your family friends peers in other words how have they responded to you yeah. taking on this uh low carb lifestyle yeah well uh, maybe we can get into a minute why i did so um because yeah. i guess that's kind of a relevant leap but i'll just say as a general point um i really don't i mean if, if some if your friends and your family are good friends and family. And I think most people are, I think we overestimate the point to which people will be judgmental about our lifestyle choices. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, my, my family and my friends, they, they ask me questions um, because they're, they're confused. And I think 
if, if I were to interpret those questions defensively, I could get offended, but I genuinely think they're coming from a place of interest and they know I'm doing better. Based on how my story unfolded, there is no question that a ketogenic diet transformed, if not completely saved my life. And so my friends and family are just glad that I'm around. And if I have to have like salmon with homemade mayo with, and bacon for dinner while they have something else, then like, I don't think they really care. Um, and, and they're curious about it. I think uh, my family and friends, a lot of them have either turned low carb or keto um, following on my lifestyle choices because they just wanted to explore it for themselves. And even physicians I know, doctors that have treated me have, because of my story, at least allegedly, according to them, started treating other patients with ketogenic diets. So I think, you know, we talk a lot about keto adaptation. Maybe people have heard that term where you're physiologically adapting to ketosis. I, I now, um, I, I tried to coin the term the other day on Twitter, social keto adaptation, by which I'm referring to the phenomenon that at the beginning, for whatever reason you choose to go on a low carb diet, be it weight loss, you know, managing your blood sugar, whatever, there is uh, a negative social impact of that choice generally. And I, I think that's fair to claim that you have to say no in awkward social situations, maybe mm -hmm. refuse food, be the party pooper who doesn't want to have cake at the office party and maybe get weird looks from people. But then you go through this transformation where that negative social attention actually becomes positive as you reclaim your health, you feel better and people observe that and generally people follow you and are curious about it. And then it becomes a node of conversation and positive social attention. I've experienced that. I know a lot of other people have. So I, I do like that, that concept of social keto adaptation because I definitely know I've, I've felt it. Yeah. And I, I, I was thinking about your brother. What's your brother's name now? His That's name is Washington. Sam. His name is okay. Sam Norwitz. And um, I'm just going to plug, shameless plug on, he's a, he's a neuroscientist, an excellent student, but now a, a musician. Mm. And he's going to have some like, uh, uh, he has a YouTube, a little YouTube channel. His name is Sam uh, Damon on YouTube, D-A-M-A-N. It's a call out to our, our late grandfather who called him Sam Deman. And, mm. uh, but anyway, he's, gonna put, he's putting some stuff on, um, on uh, iTunes. And if I may, for the show notes, share one link, because he's just a phenomenal musician. And yeah. he's not, a, not big on social media, kind of a shy person. But if people like good music, I'm going to share a link with you. Yeah, I think that's uh, absolutely something we'll do. I definitely shamelessly plug uh, Brandon, <laughs> my oldest son, uh, his podcast, uh, uh, Rhythmus uh, Negros, which is, you know, kind of Latin American, African American connection. So I think that we're, we're cool. supposed to do that. We love our family. Yeah. And I think one, one, I don't know if he's doing low carb or keto, but I know when my sons, Brandon and Justin, did it. Uh, it definitely helped them study better at Washu. <laughs> trust me, the focus, the, I mean, it's off the off, chain. It's off the, it's yeah. off the chains People where you can't, can do productivity wise and your brain is, is, is running on ketones. It's, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's just, uh, and I, yeah. So now let's, uh, let's, let's share what we have in common, which I, I was so excited when I saw it in a weird kind of way. Misery loves uh, company, right? The misery loves company. So uh, and you may have had it worse than me, but you know, one thing we have in common is uh, we both have, you know, or have had in the past gut issues, which have negatively impacted our lives. And so, me and my wife, uh, in our early part of our marriage, traveled to see some uh, another couple uh, I was in training with in Paris, and uh, we really enjoyed Paris. But the entire time I'm in Paris, I'm dealing with an irritable uh, bowel problem. And so it's hard to enjoy one of the most romantic places on the planet if you're worried about your stomach. And um, But the other part that I think about with you that really connects us is that I was uh, at my uh, college graduation uh, sitting in my seat. And of course, you're nervous about you know being called and going to the stage. And, and I had a moment when my irritable bowel flared up. So I had to run to the bathroom. I don't want to give details of that, but clearly I had to go to the bathroom and I hear them just calling names and I hear them getting close to my name and they had to pass my name because I couldn't make it to the mm. uh, seat and time. But luckily uh, when things settled down, I was able to get there. Probably was 10, 15 people left. 
And I was able to return to my seat and actually was able to, you know, walk on stage and get my diploma. But who wants to live like that, right? And a lot of people ask me, you know, you know, how are you so disciplined? And I'm like, do you understand what my life was once? You know, I yeah. do not want to not be able to get in front of, like I speak, uh, I think we, I think you speak for Low Carb USA, mm. uh, you know, coming up. So I don't want to get in on a stage or uh, be at a graduation or anything and have to live that way. Anything, so I want yeah. you to, yeah. So share your story about how you had a similar experience yeah. and, and maybe even talk a little bit about your whole medical journey uh, that yeah. got you into the space. Well, I'll, um, I'll, I'll focus on the gut stuff. I will say that of, of the three things I've dealt with, so I developed osteoporosis, which is really weird in a young man, like really bizarre, no family history, what's going on, normal weight, normal testosterone, vitamin D, calcium, all the baselines, and like genuine osteoporosis. I had like a heart problem where my heart rate was in the 20s. Um, so those are a lot more extreme, but I think the most insufferable one has been the gut issues. So um, in between the heart issues and the bone issues, I developed ulcerative colitis, which is an inflammatory bowel disease. And I developed that uh, at around age uh, like 21. I was diagnosed at 22 when I was graduating college. And, um, you know, I, it was str- it was hard for me with the osteoporosis to like have to give up running, which is a sport I love. The, the heart thing was kind of scary. But nothing wrecks your life like a gut problem. And the thing about it is that it's an invisible illness because I'm sure you were pretty good at this and I know I was pretty good at, you can cover it up. It's embarrassing Mm -hmm. and you can cover it up so you can just muddle through. But then things like social interactions, especially around meals are horrifying. You're miserable inside and just putting on a happy face. It makes life just, pardon the pun, shit. It makes life (laughs) shit. And um, as just a case in point, um was was yeah my graduation story um so i was actually speaking at my my graduation um uh, it was 2018 i was graduating from dartmouth and i was the the valedictory speaker so i had to speak in front of or got to speak in front of 11,000 people and i was excited about that um and i I don't generally get nerves about anything uh in terms of like you know taking a test xyz um but the gut stuff does cause me a lot of, of nerves so um and anxiety. So the days leading up to it, I went to the lengths of like, I didn't, at this point, I didn't fast. I was trying to eat six small meals a day. I didn't eat for like the whole day before. And then I gave myself a coffee enema with, I didn't know how to do it. So it was basically just like, I went to the dining hall and got some coffee that morning at 3am because I didn't want to have a problem. Uh, and I was just like, um, just nervous the entire time. What if something goes off? But like, that is just a tip of the iceberg phenomenon. That was like representative of my days, um, going to the dining hall, trying to be happy, going out, trying to be happy, going anywhere, trying to be, be happy and not worry about that. It's, it's really insufferable. And it just got honestly worse when, when I went to Oxford and relocated to the point that I, you know, this was before a ketogenic diet. I could not, there came a point where I, you know, my future seemed so bright. Remember that, 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 that life of privilege I was talking about, like everything was stacked perfectly for me. Like my, my, you know, I had the education, I had just the, the genetics and the, the resources and the, the financial support or, or scholarships, yet I couldn't do my studies because I just, I, I couldn't think, I felt like crap. Uh, I had no energy. It was like, it went to the point over the course of a couple of years where I had been able to get up every Sunday. I went and I ran 20 miles and I hit the gym. Like I had energy out the wazoo to the point where it took me energy like like walking to lab 10 minutes felt like a marathon used to and i genuinely mean that it took so much out of me and i I couldn't think and i couldn't work so i was i was i was stopped at this point i didn't know like how i'd be able to do my phd let alone that harvard med school was reserving a place for me i had deferred so it's like i have the possibility there is the potential here to, you know, get a PhD from Oxford, go to Harvard, do medical school, do all these other cool things in the meantime, just love and explore Oxford. And yet I can't do it because I'm just not healthy. And all mm. I want to do is just sit in my bed and and rest. And I'm quite miserable. Um, so that's where I was. Uh, and, and, and with the heart stuff, it got dramatic when one night my pain was so severe um, that they had to call an ambulance for me at 2 a.m. and had to bring me to a hospital. 
Um, and then it was, I was, it was incidentally noted my heart rate was in the twenties. I didn't even like my, my heart wasn't the complaint. I'm there. They're saying, okay, your heart rate is like the freakishly low. Like we need to get you into, they ended up putting me, they had nowhere else to put me in the palliative care ward of all places for three days. And, I, and, and my, my stomach just hurt the whole time. But, um, you know, when I was released, I had then gone through so many different medical con- scenarios and seen so many different doctors and not to their fault because I was a difficult medical case, I really don't feel like I've been genuinely helped. I was still suffering from everything. Um, and so, and that was at the point where I, I became desperate and started reaching out beyond conventional medicine because like I said, my parents, MD, PhDs, like I had been very conventionally medically minded. I just thought, you know, medicine can cure me. And of course I can't. Yeah. Well, I, I just want you to dive a little deep. You said you didn't feel you were help. So just give me a little bit more about what you meant by that. I meant that I, 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 I had a lot of optimism with all these, a, a lot of naivete that doctors are omniscient. And I think this is a, a false perception that a lot of people have. People have the expectation that doctor, they hold them up on a pedestal. Like, you need to know everything about human biology and how to fix me and what pill to give me. Even if we don't say that explicitly, I think that's the expectation. And it's quite honestly unfair because the human body is freaking complicated. And so my case was really like, what do you do? You can be the most in, informed endocrinologist in the world. What do you do with a kid who has no history of osteoporosis, has TNZ scores of negative 3.3? He was just running 3,000 miles a year before. He's a normal weight, normal basal metabolic, weight, normal hormonal markers. Nothing shows up on a genetic screen. What do you do? Like, this is a really complicated case, and you get 15 minutes to see this patient. It's unrealistic to think that people are going to be able to, to fix that. There's so many things in medicine that we just do not know. And I didn't appreciate that then as, I mean, I guess I'm still kiddish, but, you know, as, as like a 17, 18-year-old person. And I also knew that my parents were actual doctors. And, and so, like, what did I know? Like, these people, like, if any, here's the thing. I didn't think I could help myself. I think, like, why would I? I'd be so arrogant to think that like I can help myself when all these world experts, I'm literally going to like the best at Harvard and, and I'm coming out and I'm not better. So I'm not saying they didn't try to help me, that they weren't fantastic doctors and they were, and they are. The fact of the matter is I wasn't better and I was a compliant patient. Um, and so I, I got desperate and I got to the point where I did try. I'm like, I'm going to commit to making my health my number one priority, by which I mean, I really want to focus on every other thing in life you want to focus on. For me, it was my studies. But I'm going to put that second to just figuring out what's going on in my own body. Not because I can expect I can. Again, I had no expectations. But because I'm that desperate, because really, my options were threefold. Well, suffer and live an intolerable life. Um, like, Actually, really twofold. So, suffer, live an intolerable life, or maybe I'll just die prematurely. Or I guess the third one was try to figure it out for myself. Mm-hmm. Try, just try, and just that try. seemed like the most reasonable option for me. And so I started to experiment, and um, I eventually came to the experimentation of a ketogenic diet. To cut the story short, and I had tried all other diets by then. When I say all other diets, you name a diet, I promise you, I. Like I'd, I'd tried that diet, be it veganism, pescatarianism, Mediterranean, um, low FODMAP, SCD, like anything. I tried anything. And with keto, it was, it was phenomenal within a week. Really, my life changed in a week. Um, it was, it was, yeah, I think like what, uh, June 2019. So just over a year ago. And what happened was I, I tried it and my symptoms of colitis, they went away. How Along long with did an it take? reduction, they just, like my bloody diarrhea, to be graphic about it, just stopped. And my inflammation marker, we tested it a week later, it dropped eightfold to its lowest level ever, normal range. And over time, I just came off my medications for the colitis and it just, I never, I never had colitis problems again. Now, I do still have some gut problems. It's not perfect. It, it, I have some IBSC that's probably the hardest thing I deal with. But, you know, compared to where I was, like, you know, and now I can get up, I can go, I just have energy to go do things. And I love to work. I get, you can go on my Twitter the other day, I guess it, this won't, this cast won't go up for a little while, but you look back a couple of days on my Twitter 
from now. And you'll see a, a shot of me with a big smile on saying like, I just couldn't sleep. I'm so excited. Me and Dave, like Feldman, we're working on this project. Yeah. I needed to look at the data. Like that kind of energy that I just, I want to get up and I want to do things. I'm happy and I'm enthused for life, be that sports and hanging out with people or just working. It, it's, it's, it's really just transformed my life. I'm not saying it's going to have the same massive impact on everybody, but, um, you know, originally you opposed the question to me about, uh, you know, how do people react to your, I guess the word you'd use originally was keto evangelism, I think. And, and, and we had a, a message stream and, and that's the funny thing is that word evangelism it's a ne it has negative connotation for, I think, good reason. And, and I see, I, I really do appreciate people on the outside looking in on keto quote evangelists and being like, these people are crazy. It, it's just too much. And, and a lot of people maybe don't have that response to a ketogenic diet, but here's my thought. My thought is if you are someone who's suffering with a health condition, be it as severe as mine or yours or, or anything, even obesity, wouldn't you like to be that evangelical, that person that mm -hmm. had the epiphany moment and be like, this transformed my life. And you get so excited about it that you want to share it. That's right. And so I can't promise you it's going to transform your life like it did mine. But if you're suffering with something and it might help, what do you have to lose by giving it a genuine shot? And then if you become that biased evangelical, I guess uh, that sucks. Yeah. I don't know. Like I kind of like being on that side. And, and again, I'm like, I'm not, not everybody has to do this. In fact, not everybody should do this. But I, I now realize how powerful food as medicine really can be. And um, and that just that really did transform not only my my life in terms of personal life, but my academic life and my mm -hmm. professional life and really my social life now, given the, the circles I'm running in it, it. It just completely changed directions. And I could not be happier. And I could not be more grateful, in fact. For what happened to me because now i'm just I, i'm full of energy and purpose to be quite honest i'm not going to be yeah. a burned out doctor i know i never will be because i just i know what i can do because i'm already doing it a little bit and i see how it can, can transform lives i can promise you you won't be a burnt out doctor i promise you won't be a tired doctor i promise you won't be a doctor who don't have energy because i'm twice your twice your age and i feel like I'm your age. So I promise you that. And and I think that the old version of you or me, if I was in your shoes and I had an opportunity to work with a uh, with some of these greats like Dr. Dave Feldman, I mean, I'd probably wake up in the middle of the night, but it's not to be to celebrate, probably because my stomach was probably bothering me. I mean, I would have been nervous yeah. having the responsibility to work with someone like that. So I want to uh, I echo everything you're saying. I do want to do a shout out. I mean, you kind of quickly said valedictorian at a freaking Ivy League school. So I wanted to do a shout out and just congratulate you for achieving that. I We actually were out east. And, and when I was looking at schools for both Brandon and Justin, my sons, we looked at it. We really wanted to go to one of those small liberal arts schools, but it just didn't work out. Yeah. You, you're, you, you go to Wash U and it's like it just overwhelms you with beauty and That's great food. Amazing. and Amazing. It's got to be, other, Yale was great too, but I'm going to tell you something. We never went to Stanford, but when we saw Wash U, it was like, okay, we're done. And then it was like, not far from Chicago. Yeah. I was like, this is it. If I had to do it over, I'd probably go to Wash U. I, <laughs> yeah. When I went there, like, I could not believe the resources they had for kids, even down to like Tempur-Pedic mattresses. And then they have AC and, and my, my brother and his friends like, yeah, AC is not standard at schools. I'm like, are you kidding? Do you know how like I was sweating my ass off sophomore <laughs> summer? With like That's no right. AC at 90, it was like miserable. They People have no idea. Of their kids. And <laughs> Brown, they went to a summer program at Brown, which is a great school, but they're like, it's kind of old and, you know, they just don't have those. The resources so, are phenomenal at Washington. It's, it's yeah. insane. I, so I, I wanted I to say that. I was my brother. And I'm excited also, for you. I thought about your Twitter image and it's ironic you talk about, you know, going to dinner and the struggles and your Twitter image is you sitting at the dinner table, you know, at the table. Yeah. I thought that was kind of cool. Well, well, the, sto the, the story of that image was um, this was shortly after I discovered a ketogenic diet in Oxford. And I started working with the nicest restaurant in Oxford. It's called the Quad Restaurant. And the head chef there, his name is Rohan Kashid. He's one of the co-authors in the book. And we were friends. And so I started working with him on his nutrition. And he dropped like 40 pounds in reverse prediabetes, despite being in the kitchen 16 hours a day as an executive chef. So then he got excited. And we hosted a keto dining event where all the food was keto. And literally not 
a scrap of food was left. People loved it. So that picture is from that event where Whoa. we're talking about the science of food. There were like the like things displayed out just to, you know, talk about the science behind each of the meals that we were serving. Cool. They had been like formulated. And um, that was just, a, I guess, like a seven hour dinner or something where we were all there. And that's where I met my friend Martina, co-author on the cookbook as well. So it was one of those moments where like, you know, a ketogenic diet, it wasn't, and I think this will be the future, it wasn't making meals socially awkward. It was the nucleus for it to come mm -hmm. around and discuss. So that picture is me sitting at a table just talking about some of the space and, and, and people loved it. It was great. A lot of yeah. fun. Yeah, love the image and I'll definitely see more in the image next time. I did notice a lot of people were kind of looking down. So you're probably looking at some of the Science, information yeah. you guys. Yeah. So, and the last thing I want to comment before I move on is, um, you know, I think for anybody listening, um, you know, doctor, doctor was not a, you know, a PhD at the time when you helped yourself, you were not, and you're certainly oh, no. still in medical school. So for anybody listening, um, it's okay to be curious. It's okay to question, and it's okay to do your own research. If you just use PubMed and Google and Google and Google, you'll find answers. And yeah. so, so it's nice to have, but you do want to partner with a clinician if you're yeah. not a clinician to kind of and you know kind of clarify. But it may require your initiative to kind of move the needle because we're just so. trained to do things a certain way. And so I just want to just put that out there that there's always a root cause of everything. And we have to sometimes dive a little deeper uh, to get to that answer. So I think that's really important. And one thing I'll, I'll tack on to that, because I think it's a really important point is, um, you know, with most people that improve their health, it's not a bottom up approach of I figured out the biology and the mechanisms and now I'm going to develop a protocol it's you try the protocol empirically and then you use what works um right. and that's what i did and i think that's what most people do no matter how smart they are you can't really engineer it from the ground up you kind of have to just try yeah and um so that's why i like to say you know in the hierarchy of these different types of research we talk about like epidemiology being i would say maybe not the most robust in terms of you shouldn't at least that's not fair to say you shouldn't make your lifestyle choices based on epidemiological research. But above that, there's like randomized control trials, which we hold in really high esteem. Like this is a gold standard randomized control trial. But you know what's better than a randomized control trial? The best trial in the world is your N equals one experiments. Yeah. If it works for you, quite honestly, like, you know, you know that I'm now, we can call me a keto ambit evangelical if you want. But guess what? If you do something like you do a low fat vegan diet and it transforms your life and makes you feel better, then guess what? You can say, Nick, shut up. This is working for me. I feel amazing. So it's just about about being open minded to try things and um, and then just taking a scientific approach to it. Be observant about what works and what doesn't work. And then um, and just iterate on that and always iterate. And I think, you know, for me, there's lots of me levels of metabolic health. But you've achieved like gold star metabolic health when you can have that mindset shift of life isn't a process of just like decay and getting older and getting weaker and going down the decline. You know, life and especially nutrition, it's an opportunity to experiment and always improve yourself. So you're always ascending that you're asymptotically approaching for math inclined people, your perfect self. That's how I feel. I'm never doing the same diet for too long because I'm always just tweaking a little thing and saying, does this make me feel better or worse? And if it makes me feel worse, then that's data. If it makes me feel better, then that's a progression. And over time, you'll get to a place that you just couldn't even imagine. Yeah. And that's why we always use the term bio-individuality yeah. and just do your own experiment. And I think that's the best advice. And, yeah. and that's why more and more and more of us in this low-carb space are using the term metabolic health more and more often. Yeah. Because how you get there, we really don't care how you get Absolutely there. Good, we, we think that low carb would get more people there. But guess what? Yeah. If that other approach works for you, God bless you and, and do it. So yeah. that's that's it. We're just healers. We want to help heal people. It's an so. option. I mean, for, for me and, and probably for you too, it's, it's just, I, I think back and I think a lot of people have this thought as well. I went to so many doctors and I was never given a ketogenic diet as an option. Mm-mm. Really, I mean, Never. one 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 clinician eventually gave me permission to try it when I was interested in it and probed about it. But before that, nobody said maybe try this for your colitis. Like, what could a week like could it, could it hurt? 
can't hurt. You're already like suffering and you're not going to get a heart attack. And even if they were worried about that in the week, so why not give it a shot? I think I'm not pushing to make keto the way I make pushing to make keto a way that is actually acceptable as an option. That's, that's really all I want. And if I can help achieve that, that's great. I think um, that's what 20, 20 seconds to. to get a charger. Literally got to 20. <laughs> okay. You're good. <laughs> And while and while uh, our friend is getting his charger, I want to just say that um, I think for anybody who is, you know, thinking about any dietary approach, I want to make sure that you, uh, you know, again, do what may work for you. And that way you'll be successful if it works for you. So I think uh, it sounds like uh, my, my colleague here has tried a vegetarian diet. I've tried that. And guess what? It did work for me. I just felt better with the uh, keto diet. So I think we'll, we'll do well with that. And, and, uh, and I think it's interesting because when you think about the, um, you know, the experience you had uh, with the clinicians who are well-meaning and they just didn't have the knowledge that uh, we're learning uh, about metabolic health and diet and nutrition, when you think about the um, health system as a whole, um, I know you're kind of just getting started on a medical end and you've been on the research end. What, from your current perspective, other than obviously having people to offer you dietary approaches that they didn't, what else would you change about our health system? Just from, you know, you're just getting started, but what, what do you see as glaring that uh, you would change? So many you know, things. I know. Where to start? <laughs> um, here, here's the thing. This is, I, I, I am not, you know, um, a medical economist and I have a lot of, uh, ideals, but I don't have the solutions to get there. So I, whatever I'm about to say, is just like what I would love to have in a utopian society. It is not that, oh, people are, you know, stupid for not implementing these because this is different. Right. And I think the, the main thing really is to get to a place where we're focusing on preventative medicine and value-based care where, where, you know, there's the incentive to actually make patients healthier long term. And, and the incentives, I'm not saying doctors aren't trying to do that because I think they are, but the incentive structure for that isn't there. Instead, we're incentivized to do procedures and I, I'm using the royal we here, obviously, because I'm not doing surgeries right now. Um, and 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 prescribe drugs and research those models, um, because you know the the research landscape in medicine and the clinical landscape they're intertwined, and that creates a little bit of a problem, um, and and economic problems. I mean, there is you know right now just being timely, there was that. Um, big press release about that new Alzheimer's drug. So the first Alzheimer's drug since 2003 was just approved by the FDA. And that was despite having no solid clinical evidence supporting it. The fact that I think 10 out of 11 members of the like advisory committee said that it shouldn't be approved. And that actually the one that didn't say no, just abstained. So nobody wanted this. And then you look at the cost of this drug again, it's incentive structures, it's $56,000 per year. So if you were to treat all 6 million people with Alzheimer's disease for a decade while they have the disease, what is that? Like over $3 trillion for this drug alone. Mm. And um, it's, 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 it's kind of crazy when maybe we could maybe prevent this with proper human nutrition. Um, but th that, that all beside the point, because now I'm going... Uh, down the, the Alzheimer's path, which is where my mind generally goes. It's one of my, it's my, my favorite disease by which I mean it's the disease I'm most scared of. Um, yeah. so yeah, I mean, incentive structures, I think that's pretty clear. Now how we actually get to a value-based system. Um, I'm not sure. Another thing, and this is, I guess the onus is on both, both, both the doctor, but also the patient is to and this is happening slowly, move away from a paternalistic system where it's do as I say, but rather a, a partnership system where it's uh, a patient doctor collaborative, where the patients just is given more credit for what they are, are able to do 
and and for the information they have and and I, I do I do appreciate why this is hard from the quote expert side when it's, it's it's annoying I can imagine when somebody comes in and is like look what I read on the internet on this blog about somebody saying this will do that and so I, I see how it, it can get um, get frustrating but that said at least maybe I'm biased getting a biased sampling of the community now I'm in the low carb community where there are a ton of citizen scientists who are brilliant and teaching me things every day but I think sometimes there there isn't that communication because if you know the the, the a lot of patients become skeptical about uh, conventional practice because they don't feel like they're being helped so they're not paying the doctor the respect that they're mm-hmm. due which they always should and I always try to do um, and then maybe the doctor is not not really listening to the patient fully in all cases again I'm not singling anybody out I'm just saying this happens um, and so I think thinking about and this is I bring this up because I think this is something that anybody has the power to do, like how you communicate to mm-hmm. the other person on that, hopefully team. And and for the patient, you can actually find your team. So if you think you're doing everything you can to bring, you know, to, to facilitate a good line of communica- communication, which often involves asking, probing questions in a respectful mm-hmm. manner, not a challenging manner, maybe you need a new teammate. But I think moving t- more towards that, that team-centered approach, and that also requires, I think, a little bit more personalized medicine and more time on the doctor's behalf, mm-hmm. because how can you mm-hmm. do that in 15 minutes? How can you really get you to know your patients in 15 minutes? And, and, um, and it's hard. Well, I have a, a note taking service, uh, called script is the tablets called scribble. Yeah. The company's called I- IKS in India and they write notes for me. So that helps me, but most of my docs don't use that yeah. service. So, but, but I agree that, and I heard you quote it once uh, that you had that freedom of informed choice. Oh, yeah. You use that type of language. And it sounds like what you're kind of speaking to. You have to have information. Yeah. You have to know what's, and then you have somebody you can work collaboratively to help decide, okay, what's the next step? But it's not just a top down kind of model. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things I would want. Those are like two obvious ones. There's so many other things I'd want to change just in terms of like how doctors are educated with respect to metabolic health. That I think that needs to be a. Like yeah. a, a fellowship in and of itself and a residency, let alone just like have some training in it. Um, and then, you know, more continuous and personalized tracking. I think mm-hmm. personalized medicine is going to be the future. Um, and I see so many exciting technologies coming out around that, but even things that are cropping up like now with CGMs. I know there's mm-hmm. been controversy on Twitter over the past couple of weeks around that, but you know, I'm very pro CGM for basically everybody who wants one. I think that that sort of technology is so powerful in the hands mm-hmm. of a patient, especially when we have 88% poor metabolic health. Then you might realize that, okay, maybe that bowl of like cereal with a banana, you know, wasn't that good for me. And you actually get real mm-hmm. biofeedback and you can integrate that with how you're feeling. It's so cool. Like I don't, I've learned from, you know, ketone tracking and um, continuous glucose tracking. It's, it's like, you get this eerie sense about what's going on in your body. Once you get that biofeedback, I can tell you when I wake up based on how my stomach is doing, where my ketones are within 0.2 millimole. Mm. Like I can like tell you like, I'm I'm feeling like a 1.6 this morning. And I bet you I'll be within 1.4 to 1.8. It's creepy. But like, I have that sense now because I've, I've, you know, used the technology to kind of track. So I think those technologies coming to the fore are going to be very powerful in the hands of patients. If they're properly educated, by their physician. So I think the counterpoint is, yes, this technology can be misused, but that's why I think it's so important to have good, you know, um, doctor patient communication Mm -hmm. um, so that people can start to interpret their own data and then take charge of their health. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think the paternalistic just try this works. Nobody's going to keep compliant with that if they don't know why they're doing it. Um, But the American, the American Heart Association, they, they, put out their scientific statements and they clearly state that uh, we need, patients need to be coached, patients need to be educated. And in other words, this is not just some anecdotal evidence. This is like they, they've done the research yeah. and they know what kind of works. We just don't have a system that supports that. And exactly. one of the things that within our health system, Advocate Aurora, you know, we're hoping to have a weight management program. There's a company called Smooth Food Smart. And they have an app, and, and and within that app, let's just say you have social determinants of health issues. Yeah, they can connect you 
with resources that'll support that. In other words, make sure the food's affordable. Yeah. Maybe we'll have a relationship with Walmart or Instacart. Uh, maybe they'll have within that uh, app a, a nutrition professional who also understands what your dietary preference is. So if it's a yeah. low-carb preference, they can steer you in that direction. If it's a vegetarian, they can steer you. But the main thing is you have somebody you can be accountable to. And uh, and just being able to have those tools in place so you can reach more people mm-hmm. uh, and also support the, the clinicians. Everybody's not going to be metabolically educated as a clinician. Everybody's yeah. not going to be board certified in obesity medicine, et cetera. So we want to make sure we all kind of support each other and provide these tools. So I'm, I'm a big fan of all of that. And I think yeah. that's wonderful that that's uh, part of how you see the future. I think it's, yeah, it, you touched on something important, the, the accountability and, and the ability to be, you know, supported by someone, especially early on in the journey, because um, we just don't have enough hands it, among medical experts, if, if I'm even, if I can't even put myself in that, that the community yet, I suppose, but um, to, to be hand, hand, like hand holding people along the way. But now it's so cool with all the emerging technologies like I know a lot of people whose lives have transformed over Clubhouse, joining the Clubhouse app in like keto rooms because they can get in every day and have support right. and ask coaches. And guess what? Yes, I go into those rooms and when I'm sitting in the audience on st- or on like on stage and a coach says something that's scientifically inaccurate of a mitochondrial function, I cringe a little bit. But oh, it, it, honestly, for the lay person, it doesn't matter because the it net doesn't. effect is the positive support and overall positive information that keeps you accountable, keeps you feeling positive and keeps you on track. So you can get to the point where, you know, the grass is greener on the other side that you made it through. Whereas if you just go in for an appointment for 30 minutes, they say, try this, we'll see you in two months. It's, it's really hard, especially in the global environment in which we live, especially low carb. You yeah. Know, the, 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 the hardest thing about low carb, and I stand by this statement, the thing that makes potentially low carb, unsustainable i did a tweet about this yesterday it's not that you need carbs because you don't it's not that you need fiber because even if you did there's like you know tons of fiber foods that are low carbs it's not that it's micronutrient deficient there's not a single micronutrient that you can't get on a low carb diet that's right it's you know not that it's the social environment to be quite honest it's peer pressure that is the Mm -hmm. single thing that makes it really difficult to do this so if you can find a community to support you that's going to be your biggest tool Wow. And I, you know, Dr. Pata, uh, who's also part of the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners, when I had him on a podcast, he talked about how isolate, social isolation is a disaster. Uh, yeah. And if you don't have the ability to connect with people and, and, and be social, it's going to hurt you. And, and I agree with you that uh, maybe we'll know more about mitochondria and electron transports and complexes one and two and the need to have CoQ10 to take the electrons from here to there. Those are things that you. it's nice to know and it would be nice to yeah. uh, have that information be shared accurately. But, how, but the clubhouse model, uh, which I haven't fully engaged in yet, is a great model to, you literally can talk to the experts directly, which yeah. people can't necessarily do during this podcast. So I think that model, that platform is great. And I really I'm happy that you're involving yeah. yourself. Um, and and one of the things that I also wanted to kind of touch on, which is kind of a another hard question, but easy, and it's because it's, it's so broad and it's like, okay, doc, uh, future doc, current PhD, you know, people get sick, right? And so if you were to say, well, what's the major reason why people get sick uh, based on what you've learned so far, how would you answer a question like that? Why do people get sick? Doesn't Ben Bickman have a book called Why We Get Sick? Just go read it. Yeah. That's my answer. Yeah. He's probably right. Um, anyway, yeah, I mean, <laughs> what the way I think about it is like this. This is maybe one of my favorite, although not perfect analogies, is um, I think about health in modern times, especially, specifically metabolic health, as a tree. So you have a tree, let's call it the tree of metabolic diseases, and every branch is a disease. So, you know, Alzheimer's is a disease, diabetes, obesity, whatever they are. They all have different leaves. Those leaves represent symptoms. So they all look a little bit different, right? But they're connected by a common trunk. That trunk is basic metabolic pathologies associated with poor metabolic health, things like inflammation and insulin resistance. So really, if you want good health and to avoid that, then those branches, the why we get sick, you want a healthy trunk. Where does a healthy trunk come from? It comes from healthy roots. 
-hmm. And those roots, um, you know, are your protect the nest, so to speak. It's, it's, it's like, and I think nutrition yeah. is one of those biggest roots to have proper right. metabolic health. You need a, a good foundation. So I think why we get sick is not, I'll pass it over to you attending to your nest because then you have an unhealthy trunk and then you get all the unhealthy branches. Yeah. And it's so true. And that's actually, um, the foundation. Uh, I did not know much about functional medicine as an example. And functional medicine is not the answer to everything, but what functional medicine taught me is keep asking the why question, keep digging deeper. So when I came up with that acronym, um, it allowed me to think about all of the other aspects of our lives that make us sick. So the things that surprise me that I hadn't thought about with the nest. So if you go to the T, I had thought about how we think is important. I had not thought about trauma. Right. And I and when you get to that rope to climb up to the nest, yeah. I hadn't really thought about the R, the relationships. Like, but then I had so many patients who would come to me in dysfunctional relationships. And and once those were either improved or they terminated those relationships, their their blood pressure got better. So I so there's like things so no matter how many medicines you throw throw at them until they deal with like it could be a supervisor at work and they got rid of that supervisor at a job they stopped working at that job so so yeah I think that's a it's not like I felt like I planted you with that question because you gave the answer I guess I would have gave but it's like and we shout out to uh, uh, Ben Bickman and his book you know why we get sick and and for those who again want to dive a little deeper with the functional medicine tree just just search functional medicine tree roots and you'll see the roots and you'll notice that a lot of the things in the roots are the things that represent the nest and the rope. So thank you for that. And uh, I do want to also um, celebrate the fact that we both have the honor of being on the, uh, you know, being part of the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. I'm on the outreach committee, I noticed that you are involved in a couple of committees as well. The most obvious is the research and education committee. So I wanted to, you know, hear from you, you know, why you're excited to be part of the SMHP, uh, you know, society and just talk a little bit about what that means for you. Yeah, I think um, there's, a, there's a lot of, I, I would call at this point, politics and nutrition have both become very religious in the 21st century. Social media is great for a lot of things, but I think they made both very, very um, dogmatic. Um, and I think the Society for Metabolic Health Practitioners, at least as its mission is stated, it can help to overcome that. Um, quote, one voice for metabolic health. Remember we said earlier, we care about the endpoints. Right. So this is what it's about. This is about, you know, a, a group of practitioners who like focusing on metabolic medicine, which is a term for, you know, using what we know about lifestyle and how it affects metabolism to address metabolic disease. Doesn't that make sense to put, you know, treat metabolic diseases with metabolic health intervention? So that's what it's about and doing it in all the ways we can possibly to kind of overcome these diet wars. Now, yes, it does have an emphasis on low carb because guess what? That's probably the intervention that's most undersold now and, and the one that the literature does suggest has the most promise however you cut it because actually here's the thing low carb isn't a diet nor is keto a diet it's perpendicular to all the other diets so mm -hmm. you can kind of modify it for yourself but that's a whole nother topic um i'm excited about it because it really is a node for people all over the world to come and to connect so i can network with people like you have discussions and that we can have a community around this and and start to start chatter around it and a lot of opportunities for like-minded individuals who want to push this forward and and um certifications and trainings and kind of a standard of care i think the one mm -hmm. of one of the biggest barriers we have right now to implementation of low-carb and ketogenic diets is it's not perceived as standard of care we have the power to make it standard of care so that clinicians feel that they can implement it safely and responsibly without you know risk of major liability right. um and and you know it's it's new i don't expect necessarily people to have heard of it um but i think you know we have some up-and-coming things like with the research and scientific committee we want to start a journal around mm -hmm. um you know metabolic health so we can start publishing the case reports that i can tell you about right now 
But to get out there in the literature actually takes a lot of legwork. So putting together mm -hmm. groups of people who can start writing up those data, putting it out there to start convincing other clinicians, and then running clinical trials. Um, yeah. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a body that can bring us together and strengthen our network and start training people. Now, whenever I have a lot of people reach out to me now from all over the world, um, yeah. even though I'm just a 25 year old PhD saying, I read this paper that you did. I loved it. I want, I want, I had somebody um, from Argentina email me this morning, an MD saying, I want to do a training at a university around ketogenic diets. I cannot find a single one. Mm -hmm. What do you recommend? And now I can just say, Go to SMHP. They have a certification program. I think yeah. it would be the best bang for your buck. Then you can continue to go to Grand Rounds, continue your education, network with people. I just see so many opportunities for everybody. It can bring us together, mm -hmm. whether you be just you want to be a, a nutrition coach, a keto coach, or whether you're an MD, PhD. I know a Harvard MD right now who's doing the certifications. Like It can bring everybody together and get people a, a unified training, make the standard of care, and again, make this an option for patients, which is all That's I ever right. want. And I, and I do want to, I, I just really appreciate your comments because um, for, for anybody who's curious why clinicians are hesitant to support this way of eating, it's exactly what the doctor has stated. Um, we are judged by the guidelines, whatever standards are in place. And only, uh, and I think it was 2019, the end of 2019 is when the American Diabetes Association finally said, okay, low carb, very low carb are one of the seven or so options. Uh, it was only uh, June of 2020 or so when the College of Cardiology said, oh, meat's uh, not, not, not only not bad, but it may be good for you. So these things are new. But then you have other organizations that are still not there, the College of Endocrinology, the American Heart Association, we can go down the list. But So I think that we're making progress, but I think you're right in that Whatever the standard of care is, is what the clinicians are judged by. And when you deviate, you have to really be able to substantiate that. So we're moving towards a model with a society where the standards will we'll be able to influence uh, what the standards become moving forward. And, and all we're asking, which we stated earlier, which you stated, I just want to say it's okay to have meat as an option, low carb, keto as an option, as opposed to saying, I mean, you look at those rankings, they'll have the greatest loser ranked pretty high. And oh. then they'll have like, you know, at the bottom of the ranking and you're like, we, we, we did a rebuttal on that. US News and World Report this year put the biggest loser at position 17 out of 39 and keto was 39 out of 39 for health, 38 out of 39 total. And it was just, it's the most, it's the most ridiculous thing in the world. There was no evidence base to it whatsoever. In fact, you look at the people with the biggest loser, you know why there are no reunions? Because they gained the freaking weight back. And yeah, they gained it back. They did a six-year analysis on the biggest loser participants. And after six years, they had gained 70% of the weight back. And wow. their basal metabolic rate was lower. Yes, that's was, right. Was, was, was lower than, so I think at before the competition versus after it had decreased like 600 K cows, then they gained 70% of the weight back and it was then 700 K cows lower. So they gained the weight back and their metabolic rate was even more damaged. And so now they're unhealthy. They have to eat like 1200 calories a day to be 300 pounds. And you're like, yeah, well, okay. That yeah, that's ridiculous. Works. Well, it's right. It's right. It, and I've looked at studies that show exactly that when you uh, take on this uh, eat, you know, less move more and they tend to be low fat diets, you're, you're really going to have to reduce your calories, you know, you know, anywhere from four to 500 or so per day. When you do a low, a low carb diet is probably like 150 to maintain a weight loss. So it's just much, that's, that's an example of why it's just a little easier uh, with this that. dietary approach. And it's not to, to demonize any diet. It's just to be honest with the data. And I, I, I'm always shocked when I look at something like the Public Health Collaborative and how they collect the data. And, and you have like, I think it was, um, you know, uh, 30 plus studies, maybe 36 or so low carb that were giving you substantial weight gain to zero low fat in terms of the comparison. So weight it's loss. not that the, you yeah, weight. yeah, weight loss, right, 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 exactly, weight loss, thank you for that. Yeah. So what happens is we have the scientific data to support um, this model, and I just think we have to continue to share it. And I also wanna, uh, I think about you and your role, um, 
And again, I think 25 or not, yes, you are part of the community and yes, your voice is just as powerful. I just want to say that out loud. But I do want to say you're going to be inspiring the next generation of clinicians and maybe even those in medical research. So how what's your vision on how you plan to inspire? I'm really, I mean, I, I don't have a concrete answer for you because it's not until I'm boots on the ground, yeah. um, which starts August 2nd, that I'll, I'll really have a sense. <laughs> but I, I have, I have, well, I, I was admitted over three years ago. So I've, I've mm-hmm. known about going to med school at Harvard for a long time. And therefore, I've had the opportunity to integrate with the community quite a bit and engage with some students and even more faculty. And I'm really impressed. I know people are often skeptical. I'm really impressed by the open mindedness around metabolic health and ketogenic diets, even in, you know, the, the senior professorship who you might think would shrug me off. They're pretty in general, not always, but in general, very respectful of mm-hmm. the students and the, in the students point of view, um, especially if you ask questions respectfully and, and come with literature. So I'm quite optimistic that I'll have the opportunity to uh, I'll probably make some some degrees of concessions and, and, and know my place, but um, start integrating this um if not into the curriculum directly and and we actually are going to have some opportunities to do that then into various departments like the department of nutrition which i'm already now a a part of and um and into you know the minds of my peers because the way the way that our medical uh, system is or our school is structured i think a lot are it's it's like a flipped classroom so we do the the lectures on our own time then we come together to do case-based collaborative learning Mm -hmm and you know rotate together stuff like that and so right. if we're looking at a case all i have to really say is like but what about this perspective mm-hmm. i mm-hmm. have these data let's think about like treating a person this way and no not every patient's gonna not every not sorry a peer is gonna be like oh yeah let's like treat everybody with keto because it's not what i'm saying at all but even just like plant the seed of wait this is an option and guess what it kind of makes sense mm-hmm. and to you know if, if i if i can do that elegantly and and start to convince like a small community of people then i can think it would only grow plus the medical school loves to support students like freedom of speech and um and and passion so there's probably going to be opportunities where i can like host debates i can have people from smhp and elsewhere around the world like you know this person's like low-fat vegan this person's high-fat carnivore let's let's have a respectful debate not like you know antagonistic like, let's seriously talk about the science open-mindedly or some of the new research that's come out. Um, and then just to get involved with research and then get my peers involved with research. I have a couple of research projects going on now at Harvard um, with the med school that are really exciting about things from versus like mental health to lean mass hyper responders, which I know we talked about a little bit, mm-hmm. starting to look at these new data. And um, I think my goal over the next four years is to have a positive influence on the community and that and and be positively received so i have friends there rather than go in and try to raise hell with being a uh you know a a controversial voice that's not my goal i want to i really want to go there and get a conventional education in medicine to learn what people are learning and because guess what i know people are skeptical of docs right now at least a lot of people in our space in the twitter sphere they're really smart and i have a lot of things to learn from my peers and from those doctors I'm hoping I can contribute some degree of information as well. But, um, yeah. you know, my goal is to learn, really. Oh, yeah, and I, well, you know, with the, with, uh, you know, uh, University of Western States, I, I chose them for my master's in uh, nutrition because they were kind of aligned with this functional medicine way of thinking. And although um, it, it feels like a lot of the teaching leans towards more of a plant-based approach. I am like you. I'm a learner. I want to learn what people are learning. And, and, but I, I'll tell you as a clinician, I, we talked about mitochondria, you know. So, yeah, I mean, is it nice to know that, you know, CoQ10 or cytochrome C and uh, maybe thiamine and if you have deficiencies in these things, it could affect your electron transport and it can affect your mitochondria. Yeah, it can cause mitochondrial dysfunction. All those things are great. But what's really important is for me to be a problem solver because at the end of the day, a patient's going to come in front of you and you're going to help them solve their problem. So rather you remember the nuances of 
uh, mitochondrial function uh, is helpful. But most of the times, it's about you being able to be a problem solver. Yeah. And so, I so the approach that they have is probably a model that makes sense to me. You need the foundational knowledge. That's why you have to listen to lectures and learn. But really, it's about being able to think because you'll always be faced with a challenging patient, a challenging situation. And if I can put people on my team that knows how to solve problems, you can pretty much face any challenge knowing that there's a possible solution. Just like in basketball, we got the playoffs and they're saying Ty Lue seems to be a really good coach because what he does is he adapts each game. He has to make some changes in what was being done, not be afraid, you know, not be afraid to deviate from his current, like his plan. And he has to adapt. And those are the moments when you can distinguish a great coach from a good coach. Yeah. And I think there's a, there's a, there's an added element there um, that ties back to a couple of things we were talking about earlier. One having to do with the algorithmic, algorithmic nature of, of medicine um, that, and, and, and another to do with, you know, what, what we would change in medicine. And I think starting with the latter, if I could just, put one virtue into every doctor, it would be curiosity because mm-hmm. doctors aren't paid to be curious. That's mm-hmm. not a, that's not a shot on anybody. In fact, even the doctors that are curious, they're not paid to be curious. Again, the incentive isn't there. And so, yeah, it's great to learn what you learned in medical school, but if you learned it 40 years ago, then your, your knowledge is 40 years obsolete. So if there's any way to, in, in, you know, be that problem solver, be that hungry, curious learner throughout your mm-hmm. career because it always mm-hmm. changes. The rules always change. I'm always reading papers where I'm like, what the heck? Did the laws of biology just break or something? Like a paper, uh, one of my favorite ones from this year, I, I've talked about it a couple of times with a couple of other people, but like I was reading a paper on bile acids. And, and, and tell me, like, you, what do you learn? Like, what do you learn in medical school or wherever? Bile acids, they digest fat. This paper was literally about how bile acids go to the brain and signal through a brain receptor to alter like not only energy intake, but energy expenditure, thermogenesis, thyroid hormone, insulin sensitivity, like all these things. It was a TGR5 paper. It was a mouse model, but it was fascinating. And it was also then showing that like if you're obese, your hypothalamic bile acid levels are lower. I'm like, dude, these were things that like I thought just digested fat. Like basically maybe they modify the microbiome a little bit, but they're in the brain now? Like what's up? And and this is stuff that comes out like literally every month. And That's if insane. you can be the kind of person that actually gets excited about, I need to read this paper. This is so cool. Then yeah. you'll, you'll, you know, I, I, I could learn what I learned in med school and be a good doctor for five years, not reading papers, but in, guess what? 40 years, I better be a pretty shitty doctor. If I didn't <laughs> keep up to date. And, yeah. and that's just, that's something that I think needs to be intrinsic to the person. And what the job of medical school is, is not to beat that curiosity out of people. Mm-hmm. That's right. I hear rumor has it. It has a tendency to do that. Yeah, well, they 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 have a they only have so much time to teach so many things, and so what happens is, what are the foundational principles that will reduce variation and make healthcare delivery safe in the country? So they want to give those foundational principles yeah. to everybody, so that there's a standard. And that's why they have board, you know, recertifications and things like that. Mm-hmm. But the model that you guys have is a better model because it'll give us a little wiggle room uh, so that when we leave school, it was 30 years ago for me, literally. I mean, I'm taking classes now that I haven't seen in 30 years. And 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 so what happens is uh, if we're not con- continuous learners, we, we, we become less inquisitive and we just follow guidelines. And that's, that's why we're in trouble now. So I really think that part of what we need to do, even with the society, is just create an environment where uh, we ask our clinicians to con- be curious, like you said, be curious, be curious, be curious, and don't accept the standard, particularly if you're not being successful. Like if you're, if you're having patients not heal and not, if you have a doctor down the street who's taking people off insulin and you're struggling to do that, then you should be curious to figure out well, what the heck is he or she doing? Yeah. And and those are the things that really should motivate uh, people. So I really appreciate that. And I also want to ask you real quick, um, you're super busy. Uh, your resume is long for a guy that's only been on the planet for 25 years. So my question is, it is, it just is. So I want to ask you, uh, YouTube channel, you're here with me doing a podcast. You've co-authored a book. You've done research. What the heck? So how do you find balance so that, you know, 
I, I literally just had a, a colleague of mine, uh, and I, I don't think she'll mind me sharing her name, Dr. Katina Hope, who is another person when we do our healthy living programs when we teach, she does it with me, very astute on obesity medicine, lost a esteemed colleague uh, who was probably my age or around my age, and he was well loved and well respected, and he's he he just passed away. So so we have to you know protect the nest of the clinicians as well. Mm-hmm. So what are you doing to stay balanced and to so you can do all these great things and still be here when you're my age? Yeah. Well, first things first. I am not the pa- paragon of work life balance. I I'm, I'm a little bit of a workaholic, but that said, <laughs> I love what I do. Right, and so I, I naturally fill up all my time with, with these great opportunities because it's surreal for me to be, like you said, twenty five and like have people. Now I'm, I, I, it's, it's, it, I'm, it's still new enough for me that it's weird when like esteemed MD PhDs at Harvard say, "Nick, will you want to first author this paper?" I'm like, "Oh yeah," like, "Can I please?" And then I have to get up at three a.m. I'm like, "I'm so excited! I just like need to read all these things and piece all this puzzle <laughs> together." There's so many things that I want to figure out. And so I'm just I'm just overwhelmed, run, I'm run with energy. I just can't stop and stop because I I love it. It makes me happy, and it makes me happy because I integrate just the academic work with now I'm doing, you know, I'm a metabolic health practitioner. I'm certified through the SMHP, so mm-hmm. I get to work with people, and then I get to implement this or you know talk to someone and again be curious. It's like you're having what problem now? Hmm. I I don't have a concrete answer for you, but I'm gonna try to get one. And then see if it works. And then when it works, it's like, yes, I figured something out. And right. it, it's just so much energy. But I think, you know, the, the key to it is take care of yourself. I um, mm-hmm. that, That's always been something I focused on even well before like nutrition. When I was in college, um, I, I think you alluded to the fact that I, I did pretty well um, at, in college. And and generally people look like, okay, we know how undergrad pre-med is pretty competitive. And I was in the second hardest major that we had in terms of like lowest average GPA. Um, and, and I was pulling off, well, good grades, obviously. Um, and people were like, would, and then there was like, there was this one community of people who knew me as a nerd and this other people who knew me as like a gym rat. Cause I was working out like at that point, three, four hours a day. Like I love to swim and do X, Y, and Z things. It was obsessive. It was too much. Wow. I had too much energy. I don't do that as much anymore. That's not healthy. Don't do that. But people were asking me like, where do you find the time to do that? And I'm like, I, if I didn't do it, I couldn't pull off the, everything mm-hmm. else I do. And if I didn't mm-hmm. exercise at all now, I couldn't be as efficient just because you need to, I, need, I need to sleep. People are like, do you sleep? I'm like, yeah, I sleep eight hours a night. Do you exercise? Yeah, I exercise basically every day. I mean, I take my rest days. but um, And it just makes me super efficient so that when I'm working, I'm really working. When I put in two hours of work, like I can get a lot done in those two hours versus mm-hmm. honestly, if I take even on my off days, cause I, I force myself to take them. Like I get a lot less done, even if I just sit there at the computer. And so I know mm-hmm. a lot of people, I know a lot of people in college that would like go on work for eight hours, but just not get a lot done. In fact, I was working one summer at MGH and it was based on workloads. So they give me an eight hours workload. And I'd usually walk out of there in three hours and have mm. the rest of the day. I was just like, I'm going to just do my work. Yeah, I was a little bit antisocial in that that community. To be perfectly honest, I'm like, I'm, I'm at the computer. I'm like, I'm not going to talk to people in the office. I'm just going to do it. So I do what I'm doing when I'm doing it, and then I go on to my next thing. And you end up getting a lot done. I'm not mm-hmm. always great about that, but I think you can get a lot done when you think about. I'm not always great about what I like to say. You can get a lot done when you think about your tasks serially rather than parallel. So we tend to get overwhelmed with our to do list, but you can only do one thing at a time. So choose your thing, go all at it, and then move on to the next thing. And you'll get done Mm -hmm. as much as you get done. And I usually surprise myself with how much I can get done. I don't know. I guess I'm not, I do not have a work-life balance, but I do have a lot of happiness and enthusiasm. So I guess that's the secret to productivity. Like what you do. And if you don't like what you do, find something else to do. It doesn't have to be medicine or And that's okay. Whatever. That's okay because uh, I I remember uh, even my my beloved mom. You know, she would say, "You need to take a break." But for me, taking a break was a different thing than her. If I'm sitting down reading a book, uh, that's a break to me. If yeah. it's what I want to read, right? So, so I think I'm I'm a constant learner too. So I I can this completely resonates with me. So. I just think that you have to be comfortable and know what your needs are. So that's that's excellent. And I think about um, 
you know, I, I just think that that's the right thing to do. So I'm I'm right there with you. So I guess we'll we'll just wrap up with the uh, and you kind of answered it partially, but when you think about the nest and the rope and how you see yourself in the next year, um, I want you to think about what parts of your life you're going to focus on to help you achieve your optimal state, which obviously is to complete medical school, share this great metabolic health healing message. Uh, what do you plan to focus on? Yeah. I mean, I think all components always deserve treatment and that I'll be addressing, you know, each component of the nest, but I, um, you know, relationships to be quite honest, and I, I could talk nerd out about exercise and nutrition, but like, especially after this year, this year of COVID, um, mm -hmm. where everything has been kind of locked down to have that opportunity. We're completely in person to be meeting that next class. Like, I tell myself this and I really hope somebody holds me accountable because I know I have a tendency to not do this, but there are going to be a lot of opportunities where I could sit in my room and write papers and research and get one more paper out. And then my publication list will be, you know, 21 first authorships instead of 20 or 22 instead of whatever. In the long run, I think I'm going to have learned a lot more and have a lot more positive impact on my community and on healthcare if I can actually sacrifice that a little bit of extra work quote efficiency to then be able to really genuinely spend time with my peers and get to, to learn from them and, and meet them, um, and, and develop relationships with them and with my professors. So my goal for myself, and I'm glad I'm articulating this on a recorded video is to be able to say no to some opportunities that may arise that I may really want to grasp so that I can actually set aside time for not only caring for myself, but tending to new relationships and fostering those because I think that's an important part of life and learning. Yeah. And I think being at a institution that you're at, I learned with my kids, you know, with them being at WashU, it's those relationships that matter and you got to foster them. I had to, you know, as a healthcare leader, uh, I struggle with the, uh, it's so funny, I'm social. But yet, I you know I prefer to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation like we're having as opposed to work the room, if yeah. you know what I mean. So, so I just I just think you'll find your spot. But I think you're right. If you miss out on that, if you're in this environment with all these brilliant people and you don't take advantage of that, it, that you definitely will miss out. So I I love that answer, and I think that's wonderful. So, so as we wrap up. Um, uh, any final thoughts? And of course, let's make sure everybody knows how to get to your yeah. YouTube channel and other resources. So talk about how people can connect with you. Yeah. Um, any final thoughts? Well, one thing that I think, I don't know why I pinned it in my mind because we, we skipped over it. It came up. As you said, I like to say, talk about freedom of informed consent. Yes. I want to unpack that very quickly. And that is, I believe in freedom of choice. I believe anybody can do whatever the heck they want. Um and and that the informed part comes from when people learn, I inevitably find they make better choices for their health. So mm -hmm. I'm not a nutrition Nazi. If you want to go have an ice cream, have an ice cream. I'm not going to tell you you can't. What I would say is it would be really great if you learned about what that ice cream is doing in your body so you can make a informed decision about, you know, is it worth it for me? And I tend to find if people actually like the more they learn the more they will say no and make better choices not just with respect to ice cream but in their lives in general so I, again it comes down to learning but i i do like that freedom of informed consent and that mm -hmm. you know for for and that's why i appreciate what you're doing because i think neither of us is trying to be prescriptive here about anything just try to share a little bit of information to make people ask themselves the question so that they can make the decision for themselves mindfully every day day in and day out as much as possible rather than being just creatures of habit. So love it. there's that. And um, yeah, with respect to where to reach me, I'm probably most active on Twitter at Nick Norwitz. You mentioned I had a YouTube. I, it, it, it's like a afterthought kind of thing. Generally, if I read a paper and my green screen's behind me, I'll just like pull it up and let me just nerd out for you at 10 minutes. It's not a, a flushed out thing, but if you like the kind of thing, you can subscribe and, and see what I come up, I come out with. But um and yeah, I'll, I'll see how I communicate over the next several years. I just, I'm kind of laying low a little bit until I'm a full-fledged MD, PhD, so I don't get myself in trouble. I, I, yeah. I, I, I see myself sticking my foot in my mouth on social media and then having HMS or MGH <laughs> down on me and squish me. 
a little afraid. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, be, be cautious. And I, just, I mentioned to you before we started, I've worked for a large health system. Yeah. So I think we need to be cautious, but yet we not be afraid to speak truth yeah, to power. I, I'm, I'm generally someone that will, like, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty open book, which can get me in trouble sometimes. You can literally ask yeah. me literally anything and I'll, I'll probably answer it. So that's fair. It's a way I like to live, but it could get me in trouble, especially where I am in my career. But yeah, find me on Twitter at Nick Norwitz. And um, I hope to connect with each and every person listening to this. And I genuinely mean that um, yeah. in, in future. I, I, it is what makes my life pleasurable, meeting people like you and, and hearing people's stories. Uh, in fact, what I kind of do, I like to collect. I have a stat article, uh, this, this stat um, uh, news, and um, and on my YouTube channel. If you see my story, I love when people mm-hmm. post their stories in the comments. Yeah. Or on, actually, you can't post anything on stat anymore; they close the comments. But um, if you, if you have a story you want to share, put it in the comments of of my YouTube story, just so I can read it and hear what's going on with you. I probably will reply. I get notifications. And I just, I just love that. We all have so many really interesting stories um, and I like to read them. Excellent. So just very happy to have had this conversation beyond Twitter. Uh, and it's nice to, that we, uh, we know each other uh, more now. So it's really cool. And well, we did a couple of other videos, guys. Um, and uh, so those videos will be coming out uh, maybe a week or so after the podcast. Uh, so, so I just want to thank you again, Dr. Nick. And uh, thank you. I really, uh, you know, we're excited uh, for you, Doc. Uh, I think we're all excited about your future and the role you're going to have in helping to spread the message of metabolic health. Um, I'm sure you'll inspire many and help lead us all towards a healthier future. So, you know, what would I do differently if, I were able to go back, you know, 25 years and be in my 20s and start my training all over again. Well, I would probably get a PhD in ketogenic science. I would probably find Pam Devine and Doug Reynolds and say, guys, you got to start the uh, Society of Metabolic uh, Health Practitioners. I would probably uh, start medical school with the foundation that metabolic health is the key to preventing most chronic medical conditions. And, And we can do that by using lifestyle. Uh, to reverse it. I'd probably start a, a YouTube channel like uh, Dr. Uh, Nick, and I would educate the public, and I would also partner with thought leaders uh, that I respect, and I would probably write a cookbook about ketogenic uh, diet and from a Mediterranean perspective, which I, just I thought was cook. pretty smart. Yeah, that's right. And I like to eat and cook, so we're in good shape. It was, so. <laughs> it was a good thing to ch- chill out while I was the seat, talking about breaks. It was literally like, I'm, I'm writing my PhD. I'm like, I want to procrastinate writing this chapter. Let me go like cook. That's what I'm talking about, Dr. Nick. <laughs> it's more fun. I love it. Yeah, cooking is good. So, so hey guys, so rather you're, you know, learning about metabolic health for the uh, first time or you're well educated about metabolic health, I encourage all of you to be champions of metabolic health and message it to your friends and family because you may inspire someone who really needs this information. You could literally change their lives. Uh, as you know, Dr. Nick, Nick's life was changed and my life was changed using uh, this uh, metabolic health uh, approach. So so I just want to, uh, again, uh, thank Dr. Nick for being here today. And I would also encourage those who really believe in this message to support the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. Rather, you just join them or you uh, provide some, uh, you know, financial support just so they can keep doing this great work. So again, Dr. Nick, I thank you for being here. I thank everybody who's listening. And as I always say, uh, be safe, be well, and continue to protect your nest.